Failure is the vanguard of success. The avenues of endeavor herald discovery. But this path has no end. Space is infinite. The questions are limitless. In a million years hence, we will still look up and ponder what is above and beyond. Coming up in this edition, Skylab, probing our solar system and unmasking many of the mysteries of the sun so that we may better understand how it affects our weather, our communications, and our destiny. But first, we continue our look at the early 1960s and the contribution that NASA made to the exploration of space in that incredibly exciting period. In 1963, NASA successfully launches six satellites and the last manned Mercury Earth orbital mission. Two more weather satellites, Tyros 7 and 8, are placed in orbit and they send a quarter of a million weather information photos to Earth and in 1963, NASA inserts the Simcom 2 communication satellite into an orbit 22,300 miles above the equator of the Earth. At that altitude, satellites orbit the world at a speed which synchronizes with the rotation of the planet's surface, so the satellite is stationary over one location above Earth, a broadcasting tower in a geosynchronous orbit. In May 1963, astronaut Gordon Cooper makes a 22-orbit flight around the Earth. The spacecraft is Faith 7. The mission is normal until the second day. In the 19th orbit, the five hundredths of a G light glows erroneously, signaling the start of re-entry. Later scientists find the automatic stabilization and control system is not functioning correctly. Cooper has to aim his spacecraft, fire retro rockets and control re-entry manually. He fires retro rockets at the precise moment. Faith 7 splashes down within four and four tenths miles of the awaiting carrier Corsage. NASA verifies that man can operate efficiently during one and a half days of weightlessness. The Mercury program is a resounding success. In the meantime, work continues in preparation for two-man Gemini flights. Wind tunnel tests are done at the Langley Research Center with the Gemini shape. Scientists evaluate a 150-second scale model in the hypersonic tunnel at Mach number 6.8 and 9.6. Objective, to see how stable Gemini will be during re-entry into Earth's atmosphere. Workers do stability tests in the 20-foot free-spinning tunnel with a small Gemini spacecraft model. Engineers study motions to see how well the drogue parachute will stabilize the falling capsule before the main chute opens. Work on Project Apollo continues as well. Scientists test drop a one-quarter scale model of the command module in calm water to get impact acceleration data. Workers make other drop tests of the model lunar lander on powdered pumice to simulate the moon's surface. 
tests include various flight paths and contact velocity at 15 feet per second. Meanwhile, astronauts prepare for lunar flights. At the Manned Spacecraft Center, scientists develop a computer program to simulate Apollo spacecraft control. The computer display simulates spacecraft motions on the pilot's instruments panel. Using hand controls, the pilot responds to slow the module's approach to the lunar surface. And to hover and pick the best spot for touchdown. From what the pilot sees on the instrument panel, there's little difference between simulated flight and real flight. Training continues as all 16 astronauts take part in a four-day survival course at the U.S. Caribbean Air Command's Tropical Survival School in Panama. They spend three days and two nights in the jungle, learning what they might have to do in case of an emergency tropical landing. Manned spaceflight projects Mercury and Gemini and Apollo work step by step to develop spaceflight competence. Mercury's objectives, to evaluate man's ability to work in space and to develop man's spaceflight technology. Gemini's purpose is to practice in space and develop new techniques, including rendezvous of two spacecraft. Apollo is to send men to the moon before the end of the 60s. More Apollo progress continues. NASA is to do all Apollo space flights with three versions of the Saturn rocket. Saturn 1 has two stages. There is a cluster of eight oxygen kerosene engines with a total thrust of one and one half million pounds on the first. Six oxygen hydrogen engines with 90,000 pounds of thrust are on the second. The Saturn 1 makes four flights in which the first stage is tested. Preparations are well underway for a series of flights to prove the complete vehicle. The Saturn 1 is to be used to place the Apollo spacecraft in low Earth orbit for the first spacecraft flight tests. On March 28, 1963, NASA launches the fourth flight vehicle of the Saturn 1 program. During the following months, the Marshall Space Flight Center evaluates flight test records. In a test stand near Sacramento, California, the second Saturn I stage is set for firing to prove its flight readiness. In early August, engineers fire the stage. This firing marks the first successful captive test of a Saturn I second stage. After checkouts, Workers load the stage on a unique type of aircraft known as the Pregnant Guppy for delivery to Cape Canaveral. The cargo arrives at the Cape. Meanwhile, work with the Saturn 1B also helps NASA prepare for the moon voyages. The Saturn 1B has two stages. The first stage is the same as the Saturn 1 first stage, but lighter. The Saturn 1B second stage has one oxygen hydrogen engine with a thrust of 200,000 pounds. Saturn 1B is to be used to put Apollo spacecraft into Earth orbit for practice in spaceflight and docking. The largest rocket is the Saturn 5. It is destined to send manned spacecraft to the moon. Saturn V has three stages. 
The first has five oxygen kerosene engines with seven and a half million pounds of thrust. The second stage has five oxygen hydrogen engines and one million pounds of thrust. The third stage has about 200,000 pounds of thrust. NASA continues to prepare for the flight of Saturn V, the most powerful launch vehicle under development in the free world. To prepare for launches of the large Saturn V, NASA must construct a huge building at Cape Canaveral. The vertical assembly building is to be one of the largest structures on Earth. Its total volume is about 128 million cubic feet. Inside, four Apollo space vehicles can be assembled at once on movable towers. A space vehicle and tower are to move over the crawler way three miles to the pad on the five and a half million pound crawler. It's 131 feet long and 114 feet wide and can carry 12 million pounds. Meanwhile, tests of the spacesuits, astronaut tools and space food continue in 1963. In a lunar gravity experiment at Langley, workers strap an engineer into a device suspended by overhead cables. The offset cable angle gives the engineer an effective weight of 1 6 g or gravity. He can jump to 8 or 9 feet in this test, while on the moon he may be able to jump to 14 feet. Scientists studied the Apollo Phase B suit in simulated lunar gravity. Tools to be used to obtain lunar samples are tried. The objective is to find the mobility limits of the spacesuit at one sixth normal weight while the user wears a backpack. Engineers conduct free fall drop tests. Scientists use two dummies to make tests. People make six test jumps. The purpose is to determine the freedom of movement of a pressure suit during emergency free fall. Scientists supervise balut stabilization tests. The balut will stabilize and decelerate the astronaut for safe parachute deployment during an abort. In early jumps, the jumper spins. A knees bent position corrects the spin. Lightweight tools are developed for maintenance during Apollo space flights. One small tool has multiple uses. Engineers use it on head sockets and to pull and replace electronic sub-assembly cards. Food for astronauts is lightweight. The astronaut puts it directly into his mouth to avoid it going astray in microgravity. After the astronaut finishes, a chemical keeps what is left from spoiling. In October 1963, scientists experiment to find out the effects of lunar erosion caused by landing jets. An air nozzle which simulates the jets is dropped towards a dustbed. Scientists analyze how window visibility will be affected, and already, much is being learned about the environment of space. The magnetosphere is a donut-shaped belt of intense radiation encircling Earth. In our next edition, we'll learn about the flight test program for future lifting bodies, spacecraft intended to re-enter Earth's atmosphere. This contributes to the development of the Space Shuttle.
The Sun is an average middle-aged star, yet it will generate heat and light for billions of years to come, as it has for 4.6 billion years past. It dominates the motion of all bodies in the solar system. Throughout history, the Sun and our solar system has fascinated and intrigued man. In the 1970s, American space exploration shed new light on the mysteries of the universe with the successful deployment of three Skylab missions, missions that provided more knowledge of our Sun than all the previous history of mankind. Scientists estimate the sun will burn for another five billion years. Its energy is created through nuclear fusion. But little else is known about the sun's surface. Solar research is vital to our control over physical conditions on this planet. A better understanding of the sun will help us cope with its menacing and dangerous aspects. During solar eruptions, compass needles on aircraft may swing erratically. Ship communications could black out. An ability to predict such eruptions would help prevent many tragedies. Storms, tornadoes and hurricanes could be anticipated if we understood what is happening on the sun's surface. The results of the Skylab mission were important because telescopes and other instruments were carried above Earth's interfering atmosphere. Many of the observations of the Sun made from Skylab were impossible to make from the ground because observation in parts of the spectrum was not possible. An instrument called a spectroscope was used by Skylab's astronauts to dissect the Sun's ultraviolet light for study. This is a small sample selection of three of the spectra. The sample spectra represents energy emission as lines, the amount of photons of light represented by the brightness and width of the line. In that way, scientists were able to ascertain what the conditions were at that part of the sun the spectroscope was observing. Another of the thousands of facts gathered during the early days of Skylab involves the corona, the thin outer atmosphere of the sun. In the corona, the sun's disk is dark, with most of the emission above the rim. The active regions on the disk itself show all kinds of fantastic forms but loops are still present, which indicates that magnetic fields extend right up into the corona. In its quiet times, the sun is far from calm. It's a churning ball of hot gases. Its surface has bubbling granules. Sunspots come and go. During its quiet periods, observations from Skylab and the ground led to a better understanding of the solar atmosphere, temperature, density, chemical composition, magnetic fields, and physics. From analysis of thousands of pictures of the sun taken in the ultraviolet spectrum, we gain new insights on how wave energy is transmitted upward to heat the outer layer of the sun. Ultraviolet pictures were processed with color-coded differences. Green shows that part of the sun called the chromosphere with temperatures of about 35,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Red reveals the hotter part of the chromosphere, which is almost 270,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Blue shows the corona with temperatures around two and a half million degrees Fahrenheit. The poles of the sun were found to be different from the rest of the star. At the poles, the solar atmosphere is stretched upwards and there are long-lived holes in the corona. At these holes, the sun's magnetic field is relaxed and solar particles and the solar wind can flow easily into space. That the coronal holes were clearly the source of solar wind disturbances was an important finding. The solar wind affects the Earth's upper atmosphere. Changes in the upper atmosphere affect radio communications as well as weather on Earth. Bright points of light dot the solar disk. Scientists checked magnetic maps of the sun and found that the bright points lie over compact magnetic regions that have both positive and negative polarity. About a hundred of these bright points can be seen at one time in the sun's atmosphere. And they come and go at about eight hour intervals, although some last longer and others are gone in a few minutes. X-rays are emitted by the sun's high temperature gases, so only the hot corona is seen. Almost 60,000 X-ray pictures of the corona were taken. 
scientists learn that the corona is built almost entirely of magnetic loops and arches. Cloud-like extensions of the chromosphere are called solar prominences. They're associated with magnetic fields on the sun's surface. These long ribbons persist for weeks or even months before fading. The sun's outer atmosphere, or corona, reaches out millions of miles. One of Skylab's telescopes masks the sun's disk, creating artificial eclipses. Eight months of eclipse observation were done by Skylab as compared to less than 80 hours observed from all the natural eclipses since the use of photography began in 1839. The outer corona was found to be constantly changing. The sun is a seething inferno. There are huge eruptions and explosions. Immense clouds of coronal material called transients are propelled outwards by flares and prominence eruptions. The sun can have violent periods. The success of the Skylab missions encouraged NASA to plan further exploration of the sun. Plans such as the deployment of the Centaur rocket into low Earth orbit, where it would ignite, sending a probe to the sun. The objective was to learn more about the Sun's polar regions and the space around them. As we saw, the polar regions are the source of the solar wind, which affects radio communications and the weather. We shall continue to study the sun because our curiosity is insatiable and because we are of the sun. Without it, we would not exist and we must understand how it affects our weather, our communications and our destiny. <laughs>